an elderly man, talking cats, and a boy with no memory of the blood on his shirt. On this episode of What the F Does This Even Mean? Kafka on the Shore. Welcome to What the F Does This Even Mean? Kafka on the Shore. I'm your host, Amy. This is episode two of my series taking a deeper dive into Haruki Murakami's 2005 novel, Kafka on the Shore. In this episode, I will be summarizing, analyzing, and discussing chapters six through ten. Whether you are exploring the book for the first time or name it as one of your favorite novels, it is my hope that this series offers something for everyone. In the last episode, I introduced Haruki Murakami, Kafka on the Shore, and discussed the prologue through chapter five, We met Kafka, his intrusive thoughts of his mother and sister, and learned about the Rice Bowl Hill incident and Akata's coma. We traveled nearly 500 miles from Tokyo to Takamatsu, met Sakura, Oshima, and Mrs. Saiki, and ended our journey with Kafka in a business hotel wondering if his dad misses him at all, even a little bit, or hasn't noticed he's gone. Just a bit of reminder, at this point in the novel, the odd chapters belong to the storyline of Kafka, and the even chapters belong to the storyline of Nakata, and it is with Nakata that we begin this episode. Chapter 6 We are greeted in this chapter by an elderly man and an elderly black cat sitting together in an empty lot. When I saw that it was a black cat, my western bias immediately thought it was going to be a bad sign, a harbinger of doom. In researching a bit more, though, I discovered that in Japan, black cats are considered a symbol of good luck. Perhaps things will be looking up for Mr. Nakata after all. Or, since Murakami uses a lot of western influence in his novel, it is a harbinger of doom. And that's part of the fun with Murakami. Sometimes you just don't know until you know. Nakata being able to speak with the cat makes the cat very curious at first. This suggests to me that this is an unusual talent and reinforces my reading that what happened during the Rice Bowl Hill incident was supernatural in some way. Through his dialogue with the cat, Nakata tells us that it isn't every cat, but if things go well, he can talk to some. After knowing this information, the black cat could identify who the old man was, asking him if he was Mr. Nakata. That makes me wonder what about cats, in particular, allows him to communicate with them and what they have that the cats he cannot communicate with do not. To show the black cat respect, Nakata takes off his hat. I thought that was a really nice detail included that demonstrates the gentleness of Nakata. One of the things that stood out to me in this chapter deals with Nakata giving the black cat a name. From the book. Nakata nodded and was silent for a time, then said, Would you mind very much, then, if I called you Atsuka? Atsuka, the cat said, looking at him in surprise. What are you talking about? Why do I have to be Atsuka? No special reason. The name just came to me. Nakata just picked one out of the hat. It makes things a lot easier for me if you have a name. That way somebody like me, who isn't very bright, can organize things better. For instance, I can say, on this day of this month, I spoke with a black cat called Atsuka in a vacant lot in the Tuchom neighborhood. It helps me remember. Interesting, the cat said. Not that I totally follow you. Cats can get by without names. We go by smell, shape, things of that nature. As long as we know these things, there is no worry for us. Nakata understands completely, but you know, Mr. Atsuka, people don't work that way. We need dates and names to remember all kinds of things. The cat gave a snort. Sounds like a pain to me. You're absolutely right. There's so much we have to remember. It is a pain. In the last chapter, a lot was spoken about names, and the continuation in this chapter, a different pot, plot line and timeline with it being a Kata story and not Kafka sco- story, makes me register this as a part of the theme. More specifically, how names relate to identity. Children call their parents mom and dad instead of their given names, and those names used by children have particular meanings to them and with the identity they encompass. For many of us, we have our given names, but those closest to us call us by a different name that suggests familiarity. Our names are not even decided by us, but given to us before we have the opportunity to form who we are, much less know who we are. Names and identity have been studied for decades, including Carl Jung, making a connection between name, identity, and personality, and as recently as May 2021. I've linked some of those articles below in the description box for anyone that is interested in it. We learn a lot about Nakata's backstory in his conversation with Atsuka the Black Cat. First, Nakata pulls a rock. Well, the rock says this and refers to himself in the third person. During this conversation, he refers to himself or implies being not bright or dumb 11 times in eight pages. This was this has become his identity, and when Atsuka the cat suggests that maybe he is intelligent, it makes Nakata begin to panic. We also learn what happened to Nakata after the Rice Bowl Hill incident. From the book. Didn't you say that when you were little you had an accident and that's why you're not so smart? 
Yes, that's right. That's exactly what Nakata said. I had an accident when I was nine years old. What sort of accident? Nakata can't really remember. They don't know why, but I had a high fever for about three weeks. I was unconscious the whole time. I was asleep in a bed in a hospital, they told me, with an intravenous in me. And when I finally woke up, I couldn't remember a thing. I'd forgotten my father's face, my mother's face, how to read, how to add, what my house looked like inside, even my own name. My head was completely empty, like a bathtub after you pull the plug. They tell me before the accident, Nakata always got good grades. But once I collapsed and I woke up, I was dumb. My mother died a long time ago, but she used to cry about it this a lot. Because I got stupid, my father never cried, but he was always angry. Throughout this chapter, we learn a lot about Nakata's life growing up, and that has absolutely had to impact the over 60 man he has become today. We learn that he lives in a home and is given a subsidiary by the government. He takes on these pet detective cases for extra money and gifts. He has two successful brothers, one working as a department chief in a company and the other working in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. They live in a large home and eat eel. Eel to Nakata is a sign of success and wealth. It is something that he really enjoys and another thing that his brothers have that he doesn't. His father was a famous professor. Nakata's accident caused his mother great sadness and his father great anger. His mother crying all the time and his father being physically abusive to Nakata. Both are dead. Nakata is alone. The last thing about this chapter I want to point out deals with Nakata and his shadow. Your problem is that your shadow is a bit, how should I put it, faint. I thought about this the first time I laid eyes on you, that the shadow you cast on the ground is only half as dark as that of ordinary people. I see. I ran across another person like that once. Mouth slightly ajar, Nakata stared at Atsuka. You mean you saw someone like Nakata? Yes, I did. That's why I wasn't so surprised that you could talk to cats. When was this? A long time ago, when I was still a youngster. That person, Shadow, too, looked like half of it had gotten separated from him. It was as faint as yours. I see. What I think is this. You should give up looking for lost cats and start searching for the other half of your shadow. Nakata tugged a few times at the bill of his hat in his hands. To tell the truth, Nakata's had that feeling before, that my shadow is weak. Other people might not notice, but I do. So, through this, we learn that there is a connection between talking to cats and a faint shadow. We also learn that Nakata is not the only one that experiences this phenomenon. It shows us that Nakata is not like everyone else. He is special, and that is perhaps connected to the Rice Bowl Hill incident. Another way to look at this is that he lost something during that incident, perhaps that is reflected in his faint shadow. Perhaps a part of his shadow that he has lost is out there somewhere, and it connects to the story that Oshima told Kafka about parts of us being split in two. Another perspective is that the shadow represents our duality. In folklore, the shadow is expressed as the doppelganger or a double walker or a shadow person. I am reminded of Peter Pan and his panic over losing his shadow. I think that this is an important thing to keep in the back of our minds as we read this novel. I feel that this will be important in another time in this novel. Before we move on to chapter seven, I want to point out the parallels we are getting in these two timelines. The use of words like Dura Lemon in both storylines, the importance of names in both storylines, the idea of being split apart and the search for the other half in both storylines. I think this might be an important element to keep in mind to understand exactly what the F does this even mean. Now we say goodbye to Nakata in chapter six and once more greet Kafka in chapter seven. Chapter 7 As Chapter 7 opens, we find Kafka with a boy named Crow again. This is the first time Crow has joined the story since Chapter 1. He again appears when Kafka begins to feel a little insecure or uneasy. In this instance, it is when he eats his free breakfast and hunger still finds him. Crow points out what he left behind when he ran away and reminds him that he needs to be the toughest 15-year-old on the planet. Kafka goes to the front desk and talks to the young woman working. He tells her that he is a student at a private high school in Tokyo and has come to the area to write a graduation paper. He's doing his research at the private library he discovered the day before. He tells her these lies as a way to get a reduced rate on his room. This suggests to me that he is quick thinking and can run a con for his survival. The girl listens silently, nodding, her lips slightly twisted up. She's petite and wearing a green uniform blazer over a white blouse. She looks a little sleepy, but goes about her morning duties briskly. She's about the same age as my sister. There's those intrusive thoughts again. 
He finds himself a gym and does the workout he did before he left Tokyo. This routine gives him a feeling of control. It's an example of him continuing to sharpen the tools he feels he will need for survival. While he is doing his circuit, he listens to Prince. A moment for Prince Rogers Nelson. After his workout at the gym, he gets on the train and goes to the Kimura Library. Oshima is working the desk when he gets there. Still not going back to school, I see. I'm never going back, I confess. A library is a pretty good alternative then, he says. He turns around to check the time on the clock behind him, then goes back to his reading. Kafka has been very careful not to draw attention to himself, to make up an identity, and to not tell those he runs into the truthfulness of his situation. This small exchange at the Oshima is Kafka letting someone into his plans, even if just a little. Remember when Kafka took the name Kafka in Chapter 5, and I said that it seemed like a strange choice based on Sakura's response? That wasn't a common name, and he had taken such great care to not draw attention to himself that it was curious that he had chosen that name? We have another incident of that here with Oshima after the girl from the hotel calls the library to tell him the manager has agreed to the new rates. Kafka Tamura? That's my name. Kind of strange. Well, that's my name, I insist. This is another example that demonstrates that the name he chose makes him stand out, which goes against the carefulness in which he had planned to run away. It also goes back to the importance of names. I thought it was curious that he let his guard down with Oshima here and let him know just a little bit of the truth. Kafka reveals a bit more to Oshima a little bit further in the chapter. Kafka, I don't have any idea where you came from or what your plans are, but you can't stay in a hotel forever, right? He says choosing his words carefully. With the fingers of his left hand, he checks the tips of his pencils. Not that it's necessary, since they're all as sharp as can be. I don't say anything. I'm not trying to butt in, believe me. I just thought I might as well ask. A boy your age in a place you've never been before? I can't imagine it's easy going. I nod again. Are you headed someplace after there, or are you going to be here for a while? I haven't decided yet, but I think I'll be here for a while. No other place to go, I admit. I think the loneliness and solitude is getting to our boy Kafka. He goes on to think to himself, maybe I should tell Oshima everything. I'm pretty sure he won't put me down, give me a lecture, or try to force some common sense on me. But right now I'm trying to keep my words to a minimum. Plus, I'm not exactly used to telling people how I feel. Kafka heads back to the hotel at the end of the day and sees the same girl working behind the desk. She waves, smiles, and nods. Kafka thinks she could like him. He thinks he likes her too. The idea of her potentially being his sister crosses his mind again. At the end of the chapter, Kafka is readying himself for bed and, shall we say, is going to do something that helps him relax. He again thinks of the girl from the front desk, the thought that crosses his mind that she could be his sister. Those pesky intrusive thoughts again. Kafka doesn't let that stop him though from his happy ending before bed. Kafka follows this routine, breakfast, gym, lunch, library, back to the hotel, for seven days. On the eighth day, his life gets blown to bits. Chapter 8 In Chapter 8, we are back to the interviews with Lieutenant Robert O'Connor concerning the Rice Bowl Hill incident. In this interview, he is questioning Dr. Shinori Tukuyama, a professor in psychiatry at Tokyo Imperial University. The interview with Mr. Tuxiyama is much more mechanical than the interviews with the teacher and the village doctor. Mr. Tuxiyama informs Lieutenant O'Connor that they were ordered by the military to examine all the children in question. It was unusual for the military to involve anyone in what they did, being as secretive as they were, and usually only contacted them when they needed special knowledge or research. The fact that the military contacted them told them that something extraordinary had happened. Three individuals went to Yamanashi, prefecture to help. There the military doctor informed them that the Japanese had been working on poisonous gas but they were doing it in China and ruled out what could have happened to the children at Rice Bowl Hill dealt with that. They also ruled out that it was the efforts of the Americans. They did complete physical workups on them and ruled out physical damage saying that it must be something In the end, their determination was that this was a mass hypnosis. They all experienced and remembered the same thing, seeing the glint in the sky, climbing the hill, hunting the mushrooms. Then there is a gap, and they just remember the adults seeing to them after the incident. It was Dr. Tusayama's opinion that seeing the plane in the sky was a trigger that caused this reaction. From the book. 
There have been reports of similar incidents occurring abroad. All of them are considered mysterious with no logical explanation. A large number of children lose consciousness at the same time and several hours later wake up without any memory of what happened. I looked into this and it's an actual real thing that happened in the not so distant past. In 2015, 40 students in the UK fell ill to this phenomenon. In 2011, it happened at a factory in Cambodia. There was a famous case from 1965 in which 80 girls suffered mass fainting. That was the inspiration for the 2014 movie called The Falling. And one of the stories investigated by Dr. Gary Small in his book, The Naked Lady Who Stood on Her Head, a psychiatrist solves his most unusual cases. What set the Rice Bowl Hill incident apart from the other cases that Dr. Tsukayama had found when he was researching was one thing, actually one person, Nakata. In all other cases researched and cited, all the children woke. They didn't have a memory of what happened, but wake they did. Our Nakata is the exception. So focus fell on him in trying to understand what happened. He was taken to a military hospital in which a vested interest was taken in his case from the book. It might sound strange to put it this way, but it seemed like the real Nakata had gone off somewhere, leaving behind for a time the fleshy container, which in his absence kept all his bodily functions going at the minimum level needed to preserve itself. The term spirit projection sprang to mind. Are you familiar with it? Japanese folk tales are full of this sort of thing, where the soul temporarily leaves the body and goes off a great distance to take care of some vital task and then returns to reunite with the body. The sort of vengeful spirits that populate the tale of Genji may be something similar. The notion of the soul not just leaving the body at death, but assuming the will is strong enough, also being able to separate from the body of the living is probably the idea that took root in Japan in ancient times. Of course, there's no scientific proof of this, and I hesitate to even raise the idea. First off, fist bumps for the mention of the tale of Genji. I love that book so much. That aside, whoa. This is a department head of psychology at a medical school stating this. Even he believes there's a supernatural component to this, along with the psychological one. What a perfect way to establish an alibi. In Japanese, this idea is called Ikiro. In the tale of Genji, the spirit of Genji's lover torments Genji's pregnant wife, and the wife ends up dying after childbirth because of it. A side note, if you have never read The Tale of Genji, I highly recommend it. It is one of the earliest novels ever, some claiming it to be the earliest novel, and it has 88 editions. If you are an English reader, I recommend the Tyler or Washburn translations. This is a book I've considered doing for a what the F does this even mean on this channel. In speaking with one of my friends living in Japan, the idea of Ikaro has a lot of regional impacts as well, with each region having its own sort of legend concerning this phenomenon. So, if this is the case, where did all of the children go to? And why did they come back and not Nakata? Were they used in service of Nakata? Was someone calling to them? And why? And really, why does this phenomenon seem to happen to children the majority of the time? I look forward to finding these things out as we go along. Our boy Nakata was in this state for two weeks until one day, suddenly, he woke up. From the book. Out of the blue, he sat up in bed, stretched, and looked around the room. He had regained consciousness, and medically, he was perfectly fine. Soon, though, we realized he lost his entire memory. He couldn't even remember his own name. The place he lived in, his school, his parents' faces, it was all gone. He couldn't read and eat wasn't even aware this was Japan or Earth. He couldn't even fathom the concept of Japan or the Earth. He'd returned to this world with his mind wiped clean, the proverbial blank slate. Have you ever thought about having your memories erased and what that would mean? I, f I first thought about this when Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind came out in the early 2000s. What we go through and those memories make us who we are. Do we become an entirely different person? What's our identity? There's a saying that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So to get rid of the bad stuff, what would that mean? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this in the comment section down below. Chapter 8 sets us up for Chapter 9. We are with Kafka again. He finds himself outside not quite sure how he had gotten there. 
I try to pull myself together and pick up the scattered jigsaw puzzle pieces of me laying all around. This is a first, I think. Or is it? I had this feeling somewhere before. But when? I search my memory, but the fragile threads snap. I close my eyes and let time pass by. He looks at his watch, sees the date, and knows that it's the same day that he remembers. He tries to put together what exactly happened. By his estimation, he had lost consciousness for a few hours, maybe four. There was nothing out of ordinary about the day. He went to the gym, went to the library, had his food, read his book. But why was he outside? And why were there things of his spread about him? He gathers his things and walks out of the clearing he was in. He ends up at a Shinto shrine and goes into the bathroom there. This scene is so important. It reinforces to Kafka that his dark thing inside of him is there and working against his own will. It basically controls him. From the book. I noticed something dark on the front of my t-shirt, shaped sort of like a huge butterfly with wings spread. I try brushing it away, but it won't come off. I touch it and my hands come away all sticky. I need to calm down. So consciously taking my time, I slowly take off both my shirts. Under the flickering fluorescent light, I realize what it is. Darkish blood that has seeped into the fabric. The blood's still fresh, wet, and there's lots of it. I bring it close for a sniff, but there's no smell. Some blood's been splattered on the dungaree shirt as well, but only a little. And it doesn't stand out on the dark blue material. The blood on the t-shirt is another story. Against the white background, there's no mistaking that. So, what happened with our boy? He's got blood on him, fresh blood, and he doesn't remember a thing. I'm worried about Kafka, very worried. It's not just me worried, y'all. Kafka's worried too, he's scared. He washes himself, he scrubs out his shirt, he was going to throw it away, but the idea of the police finding him with it made him put it in his bag. His teeth are chattering. The boy named Crow appears. From the book. Man alive, how'd you get all that blood all over you? What the hell were you doing? But you don't remember a thing, do you? No wounds on you though, that's a relief. No real pain either, except for that throbbing in your left shoulder. So the blood's got to be from somebody else, not you. Somebody else's blood. The boy named Crow reminds him that he is the toughest 15-year-old on the planet and tells him he needs to get moving, to not let what is happening paralyze him with fear. It's late at night and Kafka doesn't know what else to do, so he calls Sakura. He realizes that he can no longer do things on his own. It really marks the change in him about going solo and handling the world on his own. He tells her he's in trouble and asks if he can come over. He won't tell her over the phone what happened, but she says yes and he gets a cab. Once she meets him and takes him to the apartment she's staying at, they sit down. Kafka believes he committed a crime, that he is in trouble, but he has no idea how it happened. She confronts him about her suspicions of him having run away from home, and he admits it. She tells him that she had run away too and how a stranger called the cops on her instead of aiding her. That's why she gave him her phone number. Kafka tells Sakura everything except for the omen, that is still a secret he guards close to him. What I really like about this novel and Murakami's writing is the fact that even though these are two different stories right now with two different timelines and plot lines, both stories have parallels with one another and they interact with each other. They sort of dance. It takes a lot of skill to be able to do this and Murakami does this masterfully in this novel. And finally, chapter 10. In chapter 10, Nakata is attempting to have a conversation with a cat to obtain information to find Goma. They talk in circles with one another, Nakata acknowledging that striped brown cats were hardest for him to communicate with. From the book. Kawamura is just name I'll call you. It doesn't mean anything. Nakata gives names to each cat so it's easy to remember. It won't cause you any problems, I guarantee it. I'd just like to call you that if you don't mind. Here we have another passage emphasizing the use and importance of names. A Siamese house cat named Mimi overhears Nakata having a conversation with Kawamura and interjects herself. She then questions Kawamura quite harshly and gets some answers for Nakata regarding Goma, the missing cat he's searching for. From the book. 
Anyway, what the cat was getting at is this, Mimi said, as if suddenly remembering. Not long after the neighborhood cats began hanging out at the vacant lot, a bad man showed up who catches cats. The other cats believe this man may have taken Goma away. The man lures them with something good to eat, then throws them inside a large sack. The man's quite skilled at catching cats, and a hungry, innocent cat like Goma would easily fall into his trap. Even the stray cats who live around here, normally a wary bunch, have lots of a couple of their numbers to this man. It's simply hideous because nothing could be worse for a cat than to be stuffed inside a bag. Mimi tells him that the man is very tall and wears a top hat with long leather boots. He's an unusual looking fella, one that Nakata could not miss. The interaction between Mimi and Nakata, even the miscommunication between Kawamura and Nakata, are demonstrative of the ability that Nakata has and sort of showcases his pet detective skills too. Nakata goes to the lot in hopes that he will find Goma. If not Goma, maybe the strange looking fella. From the book, Nakata let his body relax, switched off his mind, allowing things to flow through him. This was natural for him, something he'd done ever since he was a child without a second thought. Before long, the borders of his consciousness fluttered around, just like the butterflies. Beyond these borders lay a dark abyss. Occasionally, his consciousness would fly over the border and hover over the dizzying black crevice. But Nakata wasn't afraid of the darkness or how deep it was. And why should he be? That bottomless world of darkness, that weighty silence and chaos, was an old friend, a part of him already. Nakata understood this well. This directly connects what happened to Nakata as a child and the lasting impact it has had on him. It also connects to the idea given in the last chapter about consciousness leaving, also the dark omen that follows our Kafka. The chapter ends with Nakata snoozing. Even though he's asleep, his senses remain hypersensitive, sort of guarding him and the lot. An interesting point made here is that Nakata knows that it is not going to rain, that the cats know this too. That shows another connection between Nakata and the cats, but it also demonstrates that as smart as Nakata thinks he's not, he has a lot of knowledge not accessible to other human beings. And that's it, y'all, chapters 6 through 10. In the next video, I will be summarizing, analyzing, and discussing chapters 11 through 15. I thank you for your time today. Let me know in the comment box down below any part of these chapters you really enjoyed, parts you think that are important that I may not have discussed, or just how you're doing today. Remember to hit the subscribe and give this a like. I release a deep dive video once a week and audio stories twice a week. I have something that I'm super excited about that I'm working on, and I hope that you'll love it as much as I'm loving making it. As always, take some time this week to do something that brings you joy. Until next time, bye bye